how does the government pay that back? Well, you have to invest in productivity, infrastructure, job training, like for real, not nonsense bullshit, like pushing stimulus in with no actual benefit except people are putting money in their pockets and buying Louis Vuitton purses. That doesn't do it, right? It needs to be where you're putting money into either physical infrastructure or human capital that's going to create GDP by new companies, new goods and services, discovering new, you know, oil deposits or solar energy or, you know, wh whatever it is. That's really, you know, no different than like when you're a person and you borrow money, you're borrowing that money with the intention that you're going to use it effectively to, um, improve your life and then you're going to earn more and pay it back and in, in effect that's what has to go on with the government so i'm speaking about short-term rates and long-term rates as if they're binary but there's a really a whole range of rates between overnight rate all the way to 10 year to 30 year rate at the end of the day the bank looks at what the corresponding federal rate is. So in other words, they would look at what a 10 year treasury is, and then they would put a couple of percent on top of that because they'd say, okay, I'm going to lend to Dave. He's not as credit worthy as the United States government. So I would lend the United States government money at 4% for 10 years, AKA the 10 year treasury trades at a 4% interest rate. That's what that is. So for Dave, I'm going to say, it's five and a half percent, it's six percent, it's something over that because my credit is more risky than the government's. That's exactly what controls mortgage rates. It's like for mortgage rates, they just look at what's the government charging for its rate of interest and I'm going to put one and a half or two or two and a half percent on top of that. Depends how good your credit is, right? And that's where mortgage rates start to go up as the short term rate and then the long-term rate uh, increase because of this pressure from the Federal Reserve. You know, you might ask the question, why would you choose a floating rate versus a fixed rate mortgage? So there's no, there's no like, oh, this is the answer. Um, it really depends on what your personal preferences are. So example, if I knew I was gonna live in a house for 20 years, on a fixed salary because I just retired from the fire department and I was, I didn't have a lot of ability to make more money in the future. I might take a conservative viewpoint. I might say, Hey, you know, I want a fixed rate, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year mortgage, because I want to know that no matter what happens to interest rates, I'm going to be okay. I can pay this. Um, if you were going to move, you just got relocated somewhere, you know, you're only there for two or three years. You, you would probably, under most circumstances, take a floating rate, usually, and I say usually, and I'll talk about that, that interest rate is gonna be cheaper, and it's gonna give you more flexibility, and you're not worried about fixing this for two or three years. I'm, I'm sorry, for longer than two or three years, you're not worried about fixing it for longer than two or three years because you know you're gonna be out of there in two or three years. And so why pay for a 10-year fixed rate if you know you're not gonna be there for that time? So almost always it's more expensive to borrow money for a longer period of time than a shorter period of time i say almost always because we happen to be for the last almost 18 months in the not almost always environment of what is called an inverted yield curve which means that for about 18 months since i think it was october of 2022 short-term rates have been higher than long-term rates. So short-term rates are currently approximately five and a half percent and long, and the treasury is approximately, the 10 year treasury is approximately 4.2% as I'm doing this. Um, that's an unusual situation. It's called an inverted yield curve. The reason an inverted yield curve is important is because it almost always projects or predicts an economic slowdown or, or a recession. So since 1955, there's been, I don't know, a dozen times that there's been an inverted yield curve and in all but one, it's predicted a recession. Every time except one, 
a recession has followed an inverted yield curve. We've been in an inverted yield curve for 18 months and a recession hasn't happened yet. It could happen, it may not happen, it may be the exception, but it's part of the reason that this market is so confusing is that the Fed has got interest rates pegged high on the short term. They're trying to cool off the economy. Inflation has been the dominant narrative and they're having some success, but it's been slower than they anticipated. And so there's this holding pattern where the Federal Reserve's short-term rates are above the long-term rate. At some point in time in the near future, that's gonna reverse. Like we never stay in an inverted yield curve for long. This is like the longest I ever remember us in an inverted yield curve. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really important point because it's not a usual situation. And it means either we're going into a recession, that's what it generally means, but in this instance, it may just not be that. It may mean that the Fed is gonna cut short-term rates because they feel like they've got inflation under control and it's gonna go back to a normal yield curve, which would mean that short-term is under long-term. Most of the time, short-term rates are less than long-term rates. And so you're paying a premium to lock in a long-term rate. That hasn't been the case over the past 18 months, but it will be the case again. So often when you're in a when you're in a um, normalized economy and you know you're gonna stay somewhere for a long period of time, you may be better off taking a long-term fixed rate where you know you don't have variability in your interest rate payment. You don't have to wake up one month and say, oh my gosh, like my interest rate went from three and a half to 7%, which is the case if you had a floating rate, rate mortgage in a house over the last two years, that's probably what happened to you. Um, and if you don't want that, that psychological drama, if you don't have the financial wherewithal to handle that, a fixed rate gives you a lot more predictability, but typically it comes at a cost. You're usually gonna pay a little bit more in rate for a fixed versus a floating. But at the end of the day, it is a personal choice. There's no answer you can look up in a book. They can say like, oh, this is when you take a fix. This is when you take a floating. There's, there's things around it that dictate, oh, you might be better off with a fixed or floating in this situation. But it's really going to come down to your time horizons, your um, comfort with risk, your comfort or confidence in future earning ability, et cetera, et cetera. Most times that there's been an inverted yield curve, a recession follows, but it's not all times. And in fact, in, in every instance, the Federal Reserve and the government are trying to avoid a recession. Nobody's ever trying to put us in a recession, basically. So what's going on is they're reacting to something where the economy's overheating. They're trying to put the brakes on gently enough not to cause a recession. The way they do that is they hike short-term rates. Typically they miss the exit, you know, that's, they basically miss the soft landing. And so it usually goes into a recession. In this instance, it's possible that it will go into a recession still. Nobody knows the answer to that at this point in time. The answer will be resolved when the yield curve goes back to being not not inverted and we haven't had a recession, then we'll know it's the second time that that's happened. Um, could be a recession or a chairman of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve, maybe they just hit it right. Maybe they hit it right and like there won't be a recession this time. Um, what is, you know, what does it mean for real estate? Well, I don't think this is a market where you can just make a blanket rule about real estate. Sometimes you can, when there's like a macro trend of lowering interest rates on both the short and the long side, you can make, you can call a macro trend that real estate in general is going up in that environment. What we have here is a little bit different. We have something where the short term rates are probably going to come down soon to, to again, take the yield curve and make it normalized. Uh, Long-term rates, nobody knows where they're gonna be in two years, three years, four years from now. And, and that in effect is what dictates value on real estate.
Get to pick your spots in the real estate market right now. Why do I say that? Well, offices, right? No mystery that offices have been depressed. Um, you have interest rate issues on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have um, a lot of office tenants that moved out. Some jobs haven't come back. You know, New York City maybe is still at 20% office vacancy. Um, malls, right? There's been a lot of talk about how malls have been. Um, that's like a tale of two cities. Some malls perform really well. They have great tenants, healthy people shop there. Other malls, older malls, bad tenants, Sears, Kmart, places like that, not so much, right? So office distressed, malls, retail, kind of distressed, um, hotels, not bad. Apartments have been amazing for 15 years. Like that's been the trade. That's been one of the two places in real estate that you've wanted to be over the last 15 years. If you look at the last 15 years and look at the two best performing asset classes, largely it's been industrial and multifamily residential. Uh, cash flow is going up because people are moving to the city. Rents getting more expensive on the residential side. On the on the industrial side the just-in-time inventory system, Amazon, delivery services, right? There's a, the last mile, as we call it, there's a huge demand for these warehouses. So relative to 20 years ago, the necessity of having big warehouses close to cities that, that you can go in and out with goods has, has multiplied in price. And so those have been the two best trades in real estate. There's been a lot of multifamily supply that's been built in the last five years, let's say. Why? Cheap credit, we talked about that, cheap interest rates up until a year and a half ago. Um, emerging Sunbelt cities, Austin, Nashville, Denver, Phoenix, places like that, right? Lower tax, lower cost, high growth cities. Um, and and even in even in New York and Boston, there's been supply coming on, and there's been there's been a lot of supply in multifamily. Um, economics 101: There's supply demand, and you know if it, there's a supply demand imbalance, it's going to affect pricing. So, right now with multifamily, it's not bad, but it's somewhere where a lot of supply has come on, demand is okay, interest rates are a little bit high, so it's okay right now in the current environment. Um, for sale product, I think lives in a different category, and that means homes, condos, townhomes. Um, you really, since since 07, 08, there's been a tremendous amount of investment in multifamily, and much less in condominiums or single-family homes. Doesn't mean there's been none, but the demand, the investment has gone a lot into the cities, into these multifamily projects. When you look at demographics, the millennials are really like just coming into this like what we'll call like home buying stage. I would predict that over the next five years, a really good place to be would be in for sale product. It doesn't mean that rental income producing is not a good place to be. I think there's always housing demand in the United States, particularly in the big cities. You're looking at distress in office, distress in retail, even a little bit of distress in some multifamily, but on the home sale, what's the narrative? We don't have enough homes. There's not enough supply. People can't find homes to buy. Prices are still going up, even though interest rates are up, right? And I said before, when interest rates go up, real estate prices go down. Well, if interest rates are up and home prices are not going down right now, there is really strong fundamental demand for homes. And so if I'm looking at buying a home either personally or if I'm looking at a business that's flipping homes, right? I mean, I can make an argument right now, like go, go find a fixer upper in a neighborhood um, that has some restaurants around that's reasonably safe, has some schools perhaps, um, and then you know spend 50 grand fixing it up. And I think that that tailwind is gonna be there in that case. Very few people think mortgage rates are going up from here. I think most people would say they're flat to down. And so if you have those tailwinds behind you and a big demand bubble coming in with that, I would be all about 
buying houses, um, fixing them up, building houses, like, you know, any way to get into that. I said before, like, people expect interest rates to go down. Um, I, there's a reason interest rates went down for 30 years. There's probably a few reasons, but the biggest reason is that technology is deflationary. That's a super important rule. So all things being equal, technology allows more productivity. So what does technology do? It takes 10 people that were working on something and makes it five people that are working on something. It takes a farm that used to have 100 people working on it and now 10 people are working on it. It takes a factory that used to have 1,000 people and now it's got 100 people and a bunch of robots, right? So technology is deflationary because the, one of the main facts of inflation is wage growth. And when the what, what happened previously is the economy would overheat, couldn't hire enough people. We saw that during COVID actually, or like coming out of COVID where there was this competition for wages because people weren't going back to the workforce. That was a blip in this trend that technology is effectively deflationary because it's reducing the amount of jobs effectively uh, for the productivity that follows. And for a long time, when I was younger, every president talked about federal deficit, federal debt, federal deficit. Bill Clinton would talk about balancing the, the budget. You know, we got to eliminate the deficit. It was like a narrative constantly because at that point in time, people recognized like you can't, just like a person or a company can't spend without consequence. A government can't do it either. But in the last 10 or 15 years, there's become this new theory, I think they call it new monetary policy, it's new monetary policy, um, that basically says, no, 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 governments can like take on as much debt as they want and they can keep spending. And that's what's been going on in the United States is um, at the same time technology, technology is deflationary, you have the government pushing a lot of money into the economy in the form of stimulus. A lot of it's in the form of stimulus. And so, that creates inflation that counteracts the deflation. And, you know, one way to look at it might be like, oh, great, we counter, you know, deflation, inflation, you got a balance here. Um, and that's one way to look at it. And that's kind of what new monetary theory, I think they call it new monetary theory. That's what that is. Uh, other people, myself included, would say that at some point in time, when you have too much debt and there's no prospect of paying it back and you have to look at, either devaluing your currency by inflating it or defaulting or raising taxes, which nobody likes, it puts us in a precarious position. So long and the short of it is, interest rates is super complicated analysis. There is a deflationary pressure that's gonna push it down. I think that the federal government can exist with $35 trillion of debt. Like to put that into perspective, the US GDP per year. So that's all the economic out activity in the United States on a given year is about $25 trillion. And the debt currently stands at about $35 trillion. That's like more percent, that's a bigger percentage of the of our GDP than it was like after we got out of World War II. Like how does the government pay that back? Well, you have to invest in productivity infrastructure, job training, like for real, not nonsense bullshit, like pushing stimulus in with no actual benefit, except people are putting money in their pockets and buying Louis Vuitton purses. That doesn't do it, right? It needs to be where you're putting money into either physical infrastructure or human capital that's going to create GDP by new companies, new goods and services, discovering new, you know, oil deposits or solar energy or, you know, wh whatever it is, that's really, you know, no different than like when you're a person and you borrow money, you're borrowing that money with the intention that you're going to use it effectively to um, improve your life and then you're going to earn more and pay it back. And in, in effect, that's what has to go on with the government. So right now um, we're in an environment where interest rates are high, they're probably going to stay you know, and you know, high is all relative, but interest rates are higher relative to what they were. They're probably gonna stay in this 
zone on the long term for a little bit. But if there's a direction interest rates are going to go, it's going to be down over the next five years. Um, that's good for real estate. It's particularly good for homes and for sale real estate. I'm talking about residential, but it's good for all real estate eventually.